Hello, I'm David Tunick, Chair of the New York Yacht Club Seamanship Committee, here to welcome you to this evening's event. It's no secret that the French dominate offshore sailing, especially solo and other shorthanded competitions year after year, decade after decade. We're going to explore how they do it, a subject which to our knowledge has never been closely examined before, at least not here in America. And in a few minutes, you'll meet the stars of tonight's presentation, our own Rich Wilson and former Vendee Globe director, Denis Ero, speaking to us respectively from Boston and from the French Alps. These are two of the best qualified people in the world to talk about how this phenomenon has occurred in a nation that had not been considered particularly maritime throughout its long history, despite its long coasts on the English Channel in the north, the Atlantic Ocean to its west, and the Mediterranean to its south. This is a collaboration with the Cruising Club of America, the Storm Trisel Club, and Larchmont Yacht Club. With additional young guests, we're happy to report from such sailing organizations as Oak Cliff and Lysot. Commodore Shane from the Larchmont Yacht Club, over to you. Thank you. On behalf of Larchmont Yacht Club, I'd like to welcome everybody and the other clubs for joining this special event tonight. This program is the third club night that the Yachting Committee at LYC has run this spring, uh, focusing on great ocean races. We're glad the other three clubs were able to join and to add to the night to make this a special evening. Again, thank you for joining all, us all here tonight. And now I will turn it over to Bob Midland, Commodore Cruising Club of America. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. And good evening from Toronto to everybody. Welcome. Uh, CCA is very pleased to be part of this uh, cross Bergy event with the uh, other clubs. And uh, merci, Denny, a uh, Rich, for uh, bringing your expertise and experience to this evening. Uh, the French have certainly dominated uh, offshore shorthanded sailing, and we look forward to learning your secrets. Thank you. And over to Ed Caesar, Commodore of the Storm Trisel. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, Commodore Schoen and Larchmont, uh, on behalf of the membership of the Storm Trisel Club for concentrating on ocean racing in your series this winter. Bravo Zulu. Um, uh, Storm Trisel is delighted to be a part of this. Uh, we, I, I would add that we're also delighted to be a small part and a small help to Rich Wilson in his fantastic effort with the Collegiate Offshore Sailing Circuit to bring at least some of what the French have to this side of the pond. Uh, Rich is working night and day on that. Um, uh, we're beginning to get some traction. Um, we're going to get more young people out on the water and get them out on the ocean. Um, with that, I'll send it back to you, David. Uh, and thanks again from Storm Trisel. Actually, I'll uh, pick it up now. Hi, I'm uh, Dick York. I'm your MC for tonight. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be a member of all four clubs uh, and uh, also uh, Rich DeMoulin is too. Uh, as Chris Shane said earlier, my uh, yachting committee at Larchmont Yacht Club has run a series of club nights on great offshore races. Uh, kind of in the middle of it, my executive uh, on, on this, Angela Nesbitt said, hey, uh, what about the Vande Globe? It was just finishing and there was good, uh, really good press about it. Uh, and this immediately led me to figure out how to get a hold of Rich Wilson the American who has the closest ties to the Vendee Globe, because guess what? He's raced in two of them. Uh, and uh, that led me to Rich DeMullen because Rich Wilson and Rich DeMullen spent 72 days together beating the uh, offshore record from Hong Kong to New York. Uh, anyway, Rich Wilson has good relationships with his uh, friend, Denis Aurore and uh, who's a godfather in French single-handed sailing. Uh, and this kind of tied all the way back to New York Yacht Club because uh, Dave Tunick's uh, seamanship committee there had run a series on the Vendee this winter, in fact, talking with three skippers uh, during the race. Okay, uh, the Vendee Globe, what is it? Um, single-handed, 
nonstop, no outside assistance, racers around the world. Uh, the course is, uh, you know, leave the Slav de Yalon, uh, round Antarctica to starboard, finish at the start. It's probably the greatest solo athletic event in the world. It takes 80 days. Uh, and there is a spectacular finish, of course, in 2021. The first eight boats had race times within 19 hours. And three of them, in fact, had redress because they had to go help a competitor whose boat broke in half. In fact, uh, Jean Lacan uh, had, to, had to carry uh, Kevin Escoffier for a week before the French Navy was able to pick him off the boat. So a very exciting uh, race, exciting finish, but here's the big worry. Worry from the United States point of view. The French dominate. How do the French do it? Out of the top eight uh, who finish within 19 hours of each other, obviously six of them are French. Uh, so you're going to hear a great conversation tonight between Rich Wilson and Denis Aurore uh, on why they do that. I, I do want to uh, highlight just a couple of things. Uh, and I picked this up during, during one of our practices. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about the French shorthanded racing programs, Vendée Globe and Solitaire. Listen for some of the followings. They always insist that they pass on the learning from one to others, one skipper to another, uh, from a, uh, a, you know, a race organizer to a skipper. So there's a great spirit of the contestants. Please listen for that. Listen for the relationship of skippers and race, race organizers, and of course, the spirit of the fans. Uh, for example, American Rich Wilson is the hero in the fan in France. He can't walk down the street without being accosted because he raced in the Vendée Globe twice. Your speakers tonight, uh, Rich Dumoulin is going to introduce Rich Wilson. Uh, you all know Rich Will uh, Dumoulin, I think. Uh, four America's Cup campaigns, six transatlantics. He's raced in the Fastnet, Transpac, Sydney Hobart, almost every race in the world. Uh, 25 Bermudas, including, I forget, five or six podiums uh, on his own uh, double-handed, uh, in, in, in his double-handed boat, Laura Ann uh, in Express 37. Uh, and of course, he will tell you all about the time he spent with uh, Rich Wilson on the uh, on the 72 day trip. I'm not going to introduce Rich Wilson or Dennis Aro, Dave Tunick. You've already heard from, but uh, the short version is David Tunick is the proud owner of a gorgeous 55 foot SNS aluminum CCA rule type yawl, uh, which he single handed across the Atlantic. Uh, I know 12 or 20 years ago, <laughs> and it's been playing around with in the uh, in England and the uh, Scandinavian companies. He's also planning single-handed it back later this year. Uh, quick note uh, for questions and answers, please, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom page. Do not use chat uh, because it won't get picked up. We are in webinar mode, so put questions to the Q&A. David Tunick and Rich DeMullen will be grabbing those questions and interviewing Rich Wilson and Daniel Rowe with your questions later. So plenty of questions, please just use the Q&A button. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Richard DeMullen. Thank you, Dick, but uh, Dick, you did not introduce me correctly because I'm not Richard DeMullen. Tonight, I am Richard DeMullen. I am reclaiming my French heritage. Uh, I'm honored to introduce my friend of 41 years, Rich Wilson. In this photo, it's obvious that Rich and Denis are very happy to see each other. Rich has just completed a Vendée Globe. Uh, I first met Rich in 1980 uh, when we were racing to Bermuda on our car to 39 Blaze. Windy reaching race, great for us. As we pass Kitchen Shoals to report in in the dark, uh, we're in with the Class A and B boats and I happily on the radio in the dark reported, this is, this is the Yacht Blaze passing Kitchen Shoals, we're Class D. And a moment later, I heard some static and then a radio voice came on saying, this is Holger Donsk. We're class F, we're right next to Blaze. And that's how I met Rich Wilson. He was, became the youngest skipper to win uh, the Bermuda race. And uh, 
That's the beautiful Holger Danska right there. Uh, after winning the Bermuda race, Rich turned to the single-handed sailing when it was really a niche that very few Americans heard about. And it was kind of a sport dominated by, at that point, the British. And Rich uh, did transatlantic single-handed races when all kinds of odd vessels were being used, including Chinese junk rigs and others. And, uh, but he was out doing that. And uh, uh, finally, and, and his inspiration was educating kids because Rich at heart is an educator. And he developed this Sites Alive program. And in the early days when the internet was being born using a system called Prodigy, using newspapers, he was relating his adventures on the high seas to hundreds of thousands of kids in school. And uh, also bringing to them scientists from the rainforest and uh, bluegrass musicians from the Ozarks. It was quite a program. And that's really what inspires Rich. Uh, he then got into the, uh, the, the clipper ship records. And I was fortunate to sail on the third uh, record that he set uh, when we sailed from Hong Kong to New York to beat the Sea Witch. And all these were being uh, everyday reports going to hundreds of thousands of kids in the schools, including Larchmont. I got a huge kick out of going to Hammocks Junior High School to see hundreds of posters on the walls that kids had made of, of what we apparently, they thought we looked like and the trimaran looked like and the whales and everything else. So it was really a great program. Uh, this is finishing in New York. We were a lot younger. Uh, but then Rich made the jump to the, the biggest time of all, the Vondi Globes. And he uh, sailed two Vondi Globes. He finished two out of two, which itself is quite unusual. Uh, very exciting. And it doesn't matter what place you're in, it's exciting. You'll hear more about that. Uh, as Ed talked about, uh, Rich approached Storm Tricycle Club uh, three years ago, and we helped Rich uh, pull together the financing through our foundation for what became a fleet that's presently 12 Figaro's, which are the boat that the French now use for their development. You'll hear about that from Rich and Denis. Uh, and uh, you'll see these at Larchmont uh, during the intercollegiate regatta. Uh, two years ago, uh, when uh, we held the regatta, Rich came in and uh, they had a French crew there. And we're at the dinner and under the pandemonium. And I said, Rich, do you want to meet the French crew? So I walked him over to a table with four young ladies and two Young, uh, uh, young, uh, young men, uh, they were the French crew. And I said, I'd like you to meet Rich Wilson. And with that, it's like Elvis just entered the room. The four girls stood up screaming. They all jumped around Rich, hugged him and all wanted their photos with him. And I don't know if anybody else at the American tables would have known who Rich was, uh, but the French know who he is. Uh, now what's happened for 400 years at English speaking Countries, uh, mainly England and America, have dominated the oceans, whether it's naval or sailing. But since the Spanish Armada, something's happened in recent years. And this is what we're going to hear about uh, tonight. So with that, I will hand over to Rich. Good. Thanks, Rich. Uh, very kind of you with uh, that. Uh, and uh, let's see, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to screen share here to start. Um, let me just... Uh, First, to make a preliminary introductions here to my friend Denny Oro. Um, I met Denny back in 2005 when uh, I, I went to France to look for a boat for the first Vendée Globe uh, and was in Le Havre at the start of the Transit Jacques Rab and Dominic Wav, the Swiss skipper, had uh, introduced uh, me or had set up a meeting with me and Denny. Uh, uh, so I would meet him there and uh, the meeting was set up for 20 minutes uh, long. It went to about two hours because uh, Denny became very enthused about our school program that Rich Mullen was talking about. And uh, Denny has always wanted to be able to have the great, these great French races, uh, the Vendée Globe, the Figaro, and so forth, uh, uh, gain more exposure here in the U.S. And so um, with, uh, with this, we're able to do some of that. And uh, it took us a while, Denny, but uh, welcome to the uh, to the conversation tonight. We're really glad that you're here. So just just before you begin, Rich, yeah. I would like to thank you all for welcoming me in this uh, conference, and to tell you that uh, you all are our friends, of course. And I would like to say bonjour, uh, Rich Dumoulin, 
the half French guy. And uh, of course, bonjour to my very good friend, Rich Wilson, which, who is, as you all know, half French, because Rich always said that he's got two nations. The first is the USA, of course, but his second nation is, fr is France. So I'm very, very happy to be part of this conference tonight. Good, and I would also just note that um, Denny is in the French Alps, and so he's uh, starting in on this uh, conference at uh, midnight. So uh, thanks, Denny. But um, I also know that he's uh, been awake many, many sleepless nights during his Vendée Globes and uh, and his Solitaire de Figaro's. Uh, Denny has been four times the race director for the Vendée Globe, uh, nine times race director for the Solitaire de Figaro, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. And um, uh, I can also say, coming from the US, that um, to uh, be able to manage a, a fleet's worth of French single-handed sailors who are very independent-minded I mean, needs a very strong personality. And so Denny has been able to uh, manage the, this group. It's really been pretty, pretty impressive to see. So um, uh, when we started to talk about this idea, um, I invited Denny, uh, he jumped at the opportunity. And uh, I, when, when we first had a couple of Zooms to, to start to develop a, a show, um, it was so fascinating. There were so many things. Um, I thought that I knew most of the history, uh, but uh, I, I absolutely did not. Um, and so um, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna be running the slideshow here, but Denny's gonna be doing most of the talking, which is going to be great. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the early years. Denny, would you want to make any preliminary comments or should we just? OK, these are the three of the main milestones uh, to explain. Uh, for us, the whole story begins, of course, in 1960 and 1964. It is the real French beginning of the story. And 1968, two things. One is, of course, Golden Globe with Bernard Moitessier and Robin Knock Johnson. You all know the story. But the other one, which is important, is that uh, we, we lived a, a, a huge uh, social and cultural event in 68. Uh, uh, some guys of my age, I was 18 at that time, some guys went to Kabul and to visit the world through the East. And some other guys went to the West on the oceans. And today, tonight, we're gonna to talk about this generation of people who has been, who decided to go uh, in 68 and after sailing uh, and not going around the world uh, by bus or by train or by car. And this is a specific kind of population which is very interesting. You want to go ahead with this one, Denny? Yeah, so, so as you can see, um, the first uh, All-Star race, the routes were quite complicated. They are not simple at all. And um, I don't know exactly why, by, but for the second one, the routes were really clear and much more simple. And of course, you can see that Pendwick 2, uh, won the race. So this, this is important because uh, it shows that the two boats were really different. Uh, Penwick was longer, four feet longer, but the weight of the boat was half of uh, Gypsy Moss weight. And uh, the, uh, the surface of uh, sails upwind were similar. And this shows that Eric Tabarly invented uh, a kind of a new boat. And it is very important. And if we go to the uh, other one, Rich, we will discover how was Penduik and why this boat was revolutionary. As you can see, of course, uh, the boat is, is made of plywood. So she was very light. She was very easy to sail with two masts and four uh, sails upwind. 
So the, the sales area was pretty much divided. Uh, this was the first crossing of the Atlantic for Eric Tabarly. And he, he, he sailed fast, 27 days only. But if the boat was revolutionary, it is because it was so simple. Look at the inside. The inside, you can see that there is a swinging chart table and a swinging seat to have a vertical uh, chart table all the time. Uh, the seat comes from a motorbike, a Harley Davidson. <laughs> so because Eric loved this kind of motorbike. So he thought that the, the, the most comfortable seat was uh, taking, out, taking it from a motorbike. And if you see the galley, everything is very simple, very, very simple, very clear, and, and very, very light. And um, why do I say that it's a revolutionary boat? It's because it ch changed the, the way of sailing. And um, it is so innovating compared to, his, compared to the other boats. Um, I am convinced that uh, Eric invented a modern way of selling in a competition, in a selling competition. He, he, he passed from uh, the old ages that uh, uh, the, 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 the other competitors used to sell to a new way of selling and a new way of building boats. Uh, and I must uh, add something um, that uh, Gypsy Moss Skipper was 63 years old and Eric was 32 years old, which can help a lot to win a yes. race. Well, yes, that, that leads us right into the next slide about Eric Taverly. And uh, um, I would challenge any of us who might want to go up against Eric Taverly on a sailboat. He was exceedingly fit. And uh, I just remember going to the start of the, I think it was the 92 uh, O-Star and seeing him on the dock um, and uh, uh, following him around, uh, far too intimidated to go introduce myself uh, because he was just such the legend. But look at how strong he is. And that's a foiling trimaran that was uh, he built, uh, designed and built as a model for um, his next uh, boat for the transatlantic. And of course, uh, um, there is the famous picture in the lower right of him sailing with Bridget Bardot. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, anything else you want to add, um, Denny? Yes, something, yes, I would like to add something. On this picture, which is uh, just above 1976, uh, in Europe, we think that Eric invented the foils, the hydrofoils, which is absolutely wrong. The hydrofoils were invented in England in uh, 1851, something like that. And uh, the first real sailing boat going with sailing with hydrofoils what by, was made by the US Navy in 1951. And the boat went very, very fast. The US Navy tried a new solution to have a very, very fast boat. And Eric only took the idea on this tornado, tornado that he, he equipped with uh, foils. But the idea comes from England and is very old. Good, and then, uh, so let's move ahead then um, to this famous picture. And uh, Denny, you can describe yes. what was going well, on I like, here. I like pretty much this, uh, this picture because um, of course, if you see the way General de Gaulle and Eric are looking at uh, each other. It's quite deep, it's quite intense. Um, and you see that uh, two, two ministers are on the picture. One is looking at General de Gaulle and the other one is looking at Eric Tabarly. And the two guys are admiring pretty much these two heroes. Um, it's, it's really interesting because of course, General de Gaulle understood that this victory in 64 was very much more than a victory or very much more than a sportive victory. It was um, 
something like a geopolitic victory uh, because do not forget that we are some years after the Second World War and that in 64, uh, we still live in the mood of the war. And these victories started from Great Britain and London in the USA. And we all remember, of course, uh, the relationship between General de Gaulle and his friends, English friends and American friends. But we all know that when General de Gaulle could win something against the Brits or the American, he was the more happy man on earth <laughs> because he still had this complex relation with he, our friends. Of course, grateful for, uh, for the helps that they gave us uh, to be free, but with always a feeling of independence uh, with these two big nations. So this victory means a lot for General de Gaulle. And last but not least, General de Gaulle understood quite soon the impact of sports uh, in their relation uh, with the other countries. So he organized the whole system of sports in France. And we still are uh, applying exactly what he, he invented for to, in order to have good and big sports in France. So he was quite a visionary. Good, and, and it was very useful um, to have heroes uh, thereafter, it, it being only 19 years after the end of the war. Oh yes, it was absolutely necessary absolutely necessary to have this kind of a hero. And he understood the impact in the French people to have this first ever maritime uh, hero. I'm talking about modern maritime hero, of course. And he was the first, General de Gaulle was the first to create this hero because he understood the impact in the French, uh, in the French public and it worked. It worked perfectly well. Um, all the skippers like Michel Desjoyaux, Jean Le Cam, and others, we will forget them. But nobody in France can forget about Eric Tabarly. He still is the most popular sailor in our country, still, of course. And then there was this episode as well, and uh, later in the 60s, uh, with the first uh, solo nonstop round the world race with Robin Knox Johnston winning the race and Bernard Moitessier abandoning the race, but uh, sailing on and sailing another half way around the world. And he became something of a romantic hero as well for his love of the sea. Yes, do not forget when we, we think about uh, Bernard Moitessier that he grew up in Asia. And he always kept this Asian philosophy. That is to say, to be in the mood of nature, to be exactly integrated to nature, not to fight it. So Bernard always was very pretty, pretty much close to nature. And I, I would like to say that um, he is still, he's very popular in France because he was so independent, so free. And he was a visionary too. Uh, just one thing, at the end of his life, he paid, he had no money at all, of course. He didn't want to have money, but the few money he had, he gave it to the Lord Mayors of small cities. And he said, please, this, I will give you some money if you plant uh, fruit trees alongside the road of your cities. And now we have plenty of fruit trees alongside our, our small um, uh, streets or, or roads uh, who've been paid by Bernard Moitessier. So this is still the spirit of Bernard Moitessier. And he inspired the whole generation of Philippe Poupon, of course, Jean Le Cam, and of uh, Michel Desjoyaux, 
all this generation was pretty much impressed and inspired by Bernard Moitessier. And he's still a, a great hero for us. And Denny, you can perhaps go through a couple of these points as well that you had described to me. Yes, I'm, I'm going to try to be short because I could stay for a while on this, on this slide. But why did it happen in France? To me, because uh, we, we can come at, at this time in the 60s, we had two nations, France and Great Britain. Only the channel is separating these two nations. At this time, we had, and we still have, the same type of population, 70 million, for example, the same type of economy, the same type of history, we are cousins, and a lot of the language of the British language, English language, comes from France, and uh, uh, and uh, it is true, uh, we use a lot of, of English words, but we have a difference. We are an agriculture country, and the UK is an, a, a maritime country. So that is why in 64, we, we had two, each nation had his hero. We had Elta Bali, and they had uh, the winner of uh, the first All-Star race. But how did we, why did we make it different? For one reason, for many, many reasons, uh, but two or three are really important. First was that advertising was restricted in France. You cannot in France advertise on the walls. It is forbidden. Uh, you can advertise in London, in Sydney, in New York City with no many problem. If you pay, you can advertise. My father didn't like advertising at all. But when Eric Tabarly began to uh, have some advertising on his boat, my father was really very suddenly was very happy with this. He said, this is not advertising. This is maritime. This is my hero. So this is something else. And uh, as long as advertising was pretty much rest restricted, the French um, organizer of races uh, asked the big brands, the big, the big, um, the big uh, uh, companies to put their name of both and to give money. And suddenly the French sellers had a lot of money because it was really popular popular thanks to Eric Tabarly and his victory. The other thing is that, as I, I said before, we had no culture at all. We had no sailing boat. We had no shipyards. We had no sailors. We started from a white page. So we had no culture at all. So this is why I insisted uh, two sides before on why uh, Penduic II was a revolutionary boat. Because starting from a white page it is very easy. Uh, Eric wanted a light boat, plywood. Eric wanted to see outside. He went and pick up a, a bubble on a, on a plane and in, installed the bubble to see outside. Everything was very easy and very simple. Um, another thing is that um, the media uh, were really uh, quickly involved in our uh, races. Uh, for example, Le Point magazine, Paris Match magazine, Europe radio station, VSD magazine, Le Figaro newspapers. Um, and you know, you all know that French people love the magazines. So as long as the press and the media uh, follow the races, it was pretty much, it was easy to find money. So very quickly, the French sellers had money and the Brits, the British sellers did not have money to build new boats and to, to make new races. Uh, another thing is that the, the country, our country is a small country. The size of it is up, is almost like the size of, the size of Texas. So if you live in Strasbourg, close to the uh, uh, German border, 
you know Jean Le Cam, who is living on the other side of the, of the country, and you know Michel Desjoyaux, and you, you listen to the same radio station, and you look to, you, you have the same TV station. So you know exactly when you live in one part of the, of the country, you know what's going on in the other one. It's very easy, it's very simple, and it's very pretty much more complicated in a big country as your country. And then last but not least is our culture. We are Latins, uh, they are Anglo-Saxons. And as an Anglo-Saxons, uh, a middle, uh, a middle in the Olympics means uh, means very much more than a victory in a in a, a single-handed race. For the Latins, for the French, for the, the Spanish and the Italians, uh, the salt pearl that stays in the hair of the sailors mean very, very, very much more than any medal in the Olympics. And single-handed means much more than a team. We are romantics, absolutely romantics. And this, to me, explains a lot of the difference between the way the British went in uh, managing the races and the way we went in managing the races. This is a bit of a summary slide, and we're going to go through some of these races. So we, uh, we don't need to spend too much time on this particular one. But um, you can see over the course of time, uh, many, many who are listening may know um, most of these races. Uh, but uh, if not, um, you can see that they're running every other year, every year, or quadrennially. quadrennially um, but they're there are a lot of these races that are coming out of France. And so, Denny, why don't we just go through the, the uh, next slides about the different races? Yeah, absolutely. In yeah. particular, um, yeah. starting with the Solitaire de Figaro. Uh, and Denny has been race director of this race. Uh, for those who don't know, four stages, 500 miles per stage, different course every year, runs every year. And I put the, the, that uh, course description on the left-hand uh, picture, as I like that, because it shows that the, essentially uh, in 2015, um, leg three was the same route as the Fastnet race, pretty much. Yeah. So, Denny, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, this is uh, the, the most extraordinary race in the world, to me. It is absolutely fantastic. Why I Because... It is the high school of sailing. You are, of course, single-handed. Everybody has exactly, exactly, exactly the same boat. The, all the boats are measured exactly the same boat. And um, each, each leg is between two and three days and between two and three nights. Could be four nights from time to time is too short to sleep but it is not it is too long not to rest so the key point is to know how to handle your mood and to stay in a good shape even if you do not sleep and it is a pretty difficult challenge um, it started only six years um, after Eric Tabarly's victory. So it started pretty much uh, soon. And um, we go from France to UK or Spain, and then to Spain or UK, always on the same scheme. But it is the most difficult race to, to win. And if we go on the other slide, you will see, you will discover who won this race? You know them, of course. Michel Desjoyaux. Well, the guys that you, you see won three times the race. Three times. Sometimes they needed 10 years or 12 years to succeed in winning. But all these guys won three times. So, of course, you all know Michel Desjoyaux, Armel Lecléache, 
Jean Le Cam, Jérémy Billou, Yann Eliès, and many, many, many others. You cannot be a good sailor, single-handed sailor, if you did not enter 10 times this incredible race. I love this race. This is the race for me, the race. Now, I think, Rich, you could talk about the boats because it's, it's quite important. Sure. Um, well, the, uh, each of the generations, the first two generations were probably 12 to 15 years. And um, I, I slipped to this one. This is why we picked this boat for the Collegiate Offshore Sailing Circuit. Um, and we have, uh, as I think uh, uh, Ed or uh, Ed had mentioned earlier, we have 12 of these boats now um, with a, a 13th funded. Um, and uh, these were transitioning to Figaro 3s. They are manageably sized, obviously offshore capable. They'll be raced double-handed to the Caribbean, uh, 33 feet long and uh, 11 feet of beam, seven feet of draft, twin rudders, but um, absolutely durable and uh, have been sailed by the, the great sailors. And so that's why we've picked this boat for what we're doing with Collegiate Offshore Sailing Circuit. But um, it's a, uh, uh, I remember coming across Jan Elias at one of the, uh, um, uh, one of the races over there, and he just sort of quietly said, "You know, I won the I won the Figaro this year, and that was like, uh, the most important thing that it, that he had done that year." So um, we'll continue along uh, here um, to the mini Transat, uh, and uh, Denny, you could describe how this has gone on. Yeah, Rich, just one more point about this slider. I just would like to add something which is important because a Figaro boat is not an expensive boat. It's a cheap boat. So each of the skippers today uh, owns a boat and it's a little business that makes them leave during an year because as long as they own the boat, that they bought at the, at the shipyard and they all did it, they can charter the boat, rent the boat and live on this small business. And this is part of the success of this series because they can have a way of living. And this is one of the key points of Le Figaro. We go to the, this mini yeah. Transat now, which is a <laughs> transatlantic and a 6.5 meter boat solo. Yeah, it began in, in 1977. It, be, it began, of course, in England, and uh, the second edition of the race was, uh, was organized by the French. And uh, we began with these small plywood wooden boats. And we still have these kind of boats in the race, crossing the Atlantic, very simple, very light, very cheap. And this is mo the most popular uh, race uh, in France. This is the first school. Um, all the big sellers, all the, uh, the main sellers, everybody sold the Mini Transat one day or two or twice or three times. Um, for example, this year, uh, the, the number of boats is restricted to 84, but the organizer has to face 126 pre-registered boats. So the, the organizer will have to select and to keep only 84 boats. The start of the race is gonna be on September 26th this year. And it is a great, great, great adventure. Small budget, great adventure. Yes, actually the, um, the winner of the Vendée Globe this year, Yannick Bestevin, was the winner of this race back in 2000 something, I think, um, 2001 or so. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. We go to the route to rum, and uh, um, I'll just describe a little bit here. This is a solo race from Saint Malo to uh, to uh, uh, Guadeloupe, I think. Or where does it go? Martinique, Guadeloupe, Guadeloupe. Um, no, no, and, no, 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 Guadeloupe, Guadeloupe, Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe. Yes, um, yeah. and what was interesting about this was that. Um, well, one of my mentors, Walter Green, um, and one guy I got to sail with, Mike Birch, uh, teamed up for the for Mike to win 
the uh, first uh, the inaugural edition of this race. And so there was a real American influence. Uh, Bo was designed by Dick Newick, who had designed Moxie for Phil Weld, who won the uh, O-Star in 1980. Um, and it was a little 37 foot uh, trimaran named Olympus Photo built up in Yarmouth, Maine. And um, Walter and uh, Mike uh, um, were great, great friends. And uh, uh, Mike Birch caught the 64 foot monohull um, right at the finish and won the race by 98 seconds. And um, a very small sidebar story was I, um, when I sailed, I had a chance to sail with Mike Birch uh, uh, in the Transit Shark Fob that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and uh, we had sailed to uh, from Marblehead to France to deliver the Open 60. Um, and uh, we were at a party of, uh, for uh, uh, Florence Artaud, a birthday party. And uh, I had never met her. She asked me um, how I got to sail with Mike Birch. And I said, well, I've had trimarans up at Walter Green's. And she just said, ah, Walter Green and Mike Birch. That's the history of multi-hull sailing. And so, of course, uh, after the Canadian Mike Birch won that first one, then I think the French have won it ever since. And uh, now there are over 100 boats in the race. And uh, uh, I went to the start of the most recent one, and there were 53 class 40s in that <laughs> race. So, uh, Denny, what, what else to add? Well, I would like just to talk about Walter Green and, and uh, Dick Newick and Mike Birch. Mike is, has been living in France. He married a French girl. Uh, he was living in France in La Trinité. We all pretty much know Mike. Mike is a friend of us. And um, I would like to add that uh, when French people uh, began, uh, after the, the Mike's victory uh, in 78, French people understood that Maltial was the future. So what did they do? They crossed the Atlantic with a plane and they went in uh, Walter Green's shipyard and they learned how to build and how to sell a multi-hull. And then they came back in France and we developed this formula in France, but we knew nothing about multi-hulls. We had to follow Mike Birch and Loic Perron is calling Mike uh, Jedi, he's Jedi master, yes. always, <laughs> always. And it is, it is uh, uh, Mike is a legend in France. And I'm, I'm just absolutely sad that nobody is writing something now on Mike Birch because he's getting old. Yeah. And I really would like to have something written on him uh, before it's, it's gonna be too late, yeah. but this is the way it is. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there's a, some part of the class 40s lined up. Um, L teams, the Mochas, the class 40s, the multi 50s, and we'll show some pictures about that too. Let's uh, we'll move ahead here to the uh, to the BOC challenge and how that led into the Vendée Globe. And that BOC challenge, as many of you know, started in uh, Newport, um, and it would be uh, uh, it transitioned into the Around Alone and then the Belux Five Oceans, but it would be um, uh, three stops, four legs solo around the world. And uh, Philippe Chanteau, with whom Denny has sailed uh, in the past, uh, won the first two races. And then Denny, you could take the, take the story from there. Yeah, uh, well, to me, this race is the offshore sailing school. I mean, all the, the French skippers learned how to sail offshore. I'm, I'm talking about Philippe Chanteau, Alain Gauthier, Christophe Hauguin, a double winner of the BOC, uh, Jean-Luc Vandened, or Titouan Lamazou, or Jean-Yves Terlin, and all Isabelle Tissier, they all learned how to sail around the world single-handed in this race. And when Philippe Janteau decided to create the Vendée Globe, he took the boats, the rules, the spirit, the entrance, he took everything from the BOC challenge and he, he took everything in France and he, he made the Vendée Globe. The Vendée Globe is 100% uh, 
the, the son of the BOC challenge. Philip did not invent nothing. He just took everything from the BOC challenge. But he just took the stops out. Absolutely. The only difference, and it is the main difference, of course, it is the stops, no stops. This is it. But for the rest, everything remains from uh, uh, the BOC challenge. And, you, and he asked you to be the first race director. Yes, absolutely. I had been sailing with him and he said, well, I'm going to be a competitor. Would you like, please, to uh, organize it? So, so I said, yes. And I become in five seconds the uh, the organizer of the first one. Oh wow! What a, what a deal! <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so here is what it's turned into, and you've done three more of these, uh, Denny. And uh, uh, I can say that uh, uh, it, it's an unbelievable scene. Anybody who really wants to see what the sport of sailing can mean to the general public. Um, should get yourself to one of these great French races at the start because there, there are 350,000 people lining the channel on start day and about a million people coming to walk the docks in the three weeks before the start. And everyone is on your side and they're on the side of every one of the skippers and the, 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 the warmth is just an incredible thing. And I would like to add that Rich Wilson is part of this race because he entered it twice and everybody knows Rich Wilson now in France, thanks to his two entry uh, to Van de Globes. He's uh, one of our great sellers in France. Everybody knows Rich Wilson now. Well, thank you, Danny. It's like a big family. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes, it is. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, we'll keep going here. There's a double-handed race um, that uh, uh, goes from uh, La Havre to uh, Salvador or somewhere in South America. And uh, Denny, perhaps with this one, you could describe how cities get behind a particular race. Yes, all the big cities alongside the coast have a race. We talked about Saint-Malo already. Brest has a race. Lorient has a training school. Uh, Le Havre has a race, La Rochelle has a race, all the cities have a race. So it is one of the key points that races uh, are organized by cities. And all the big cities have a race. And that's a major key point. Uh, another one is that uh, this race is a double-handed double race. So, for example, on the, the uh, on the on, on the picture, you see two two guys. Uh, it's uh, one is Charles Dalin. He came second of this Vendée Globe, and the other one is Yann Elias. And uh, what I can say that during the Jacques Vabre, only top 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 sailors are sailing. And if even if you have not a boat, because you do not have a budget you can sell if ever you are a top sailor because you will be invited in one of the boats. Yes, and uh, Charlie Dalen was, was the, uh, came second in this Vendée Globe, uh, uh, was the first to actually finish, but he's been on the podium of the Solitaire de Figaro five times. So again, it uh, goes back to Denny's comment about the high school sailing being in those Figaro's. And um, I think, Denny, you'd also mentioned that when you were talking about the cities, that um, it's because, you know, for a race organizer to organize something and find dock space and pay for dock space, they're not going to be able to do it unless the city steps up to make the dock space free for the fleet. Yes, and many, many, many services, like the, the, the harbor services, the dockage, but many, many other uh, services are free because if you are an organizer and if you had to pay for this, you would not be able to pay. So it's right. free. So that's why it's possible to organize this kind of race or races in, in these cities. One of the things that Denny has impressed upon me, and I've certainly seen as well, is 
this idea of the heroes and heroines. And uh, Denny, perhaps you could just take us quickly through these these uh, uh, of famous course, Florent, people. You have heard about Florence. She won the, the Route du Rhum. She was a character. She had a sense of freedom. She would make no compromise. When Florence decided something, she did it. Uh, she had an epic life. She, she died in a helicopter crash five years ago. And uh, she is the most famous female seller in, in France. She still is popular as exactly as Eric Tabarly is. She is still is very popular. Uh, down below, you can see Loïc Perron. You all know him. 50 crossing of the Atlantic, so many victories, uh, and uh, the, the America's Cup, of course. And there is another photo that I like is the, the photo where you can see uh, Francis Joyon and Francois Gabard. It is, these photos is at the end of the Route du Rhum. Uh, and uh, Francis won uh, with a very short time, maybe one hour or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but look at the way they, they see, they look each other. Uh, it is full of respect, 100% of respect and of sportsman spirit. And this guy, at the end of this photo, they will share 100% of the experience that they had. And this is a major point. Nobody's keeping experience. Everybody is sharing the good things and the bad things. And this is the way uh, the sport is increasing and is getting better. Yes, I, I think it was only seven minutes between the two of them and Francis Joyon had caught up to uh, Francois, uh, Francois Gabar. Um, to win um, the two boats that they sailed, those 100 foot trimarans, the old teams are down below. Um, and I would just uh, add one other comment about the picture of Loic Peron. He's the guy who, uh, who regards uh, uh, Mike Birch as the Jedi master. And um, Loic, because of his respect for Mike, was going to say, take Mike's old boat from that very first route to rum and sail the race um, using only sextant and uh, uh, sail sideband radio and so forth, no modern technology. And about it was about six weeks before the start of that race, uh, Arnold Lecleache, who was supposed to sail the 135 foot bank populaire, um, cut his hand and couldn't sail the race. So they got Loic, they hired Loic to come and sail the boat instead. So he had about six weeks to prepare to sail to go from the 35 foot trimaran to the 135 foot trimaran and he won the race. So um, they're pretty versatile, uh, that's for sure. And I would also say, I saw Francis Choyon, first time I ever, uh, or, 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 uh, Francis, yeah, Francis Choyon, um, first time I ever met him was in the 92, I think, still looking for a boat um, uh, for our subsequent voyages. He arrived in Newport having uh, sailed transatlantic in a 60 foot trimaran and uh, he was repairing his mainsail. Uh, he's the strongest guy that I've ever seen. And uh, he was pushing a, need a needle through multiple plies of a Dacron sail and he was doing it without a thimble. So uh, he was a tough guy for sure. <laughs> um, and so we, we're gonna have to pick up the pace here a little bit, Denny. We got too many stories, but uh, you could talk a little bit about these boats. So uh, this was a great, great story, the Orma, but it ended up it ended up because uh, it was too expensive. That's uh, unfortunately, but the skippers still uh, speak about this series, saying that it was the most uh, the most exciting series. Uh, they they ever sailed, and and we have no sixty feet or my boat, but this is the way it is. Okay, and then the class forties came along. Yeah, 
class 40 are, are really interesting because these boats are reasonable boats. Uh, they are fast, they are safe, uh, the budgets are controlled, they are fun, and they provide adventure. That is why it is a very, very popular series now in France and in Europe. And you can buy a boat for a cheap price and you can sail uh, in high level competition with these boats. It's, they are great boats, absolutely great boats. Okay, along uh, with those came the multi 50s. And there are, I don't know, seven or eight or 10 of these, I think, that sailed route to Rama and Transat Jacques Vab. Um, the boat yeah, that- uh, affordable, affordable boats too. Small budget, big fun, big adventure, safe boat. Uh, this is for the elite, 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 elite sailors, elite sailors. It's quite difficult to sell this boat, but they are quite popular and the fleet is growing. Good, good. Okay. And then the mod 70s. Wow, the mod 70s were really exciting, really fantastic. Uh, we, we, we had big hopes with this series but the, big, the budgets were too high, so too expensive, so no future. And the last one was in, uh, 20, uh, in 2012, uh, from New York City to Brest. And then after to, from New York City to Brest, it ended up because, because they had no money. And you can see this cap size uh, on the right down uh, side of uh, the photo, this dramatic capsize. And, and this one, this was one of the last photo taken with these boats, this incredible capsize. Yes, that, and, this was uh, the end. That, that boat, in fact, uh, some of you may remember, New York Yacht Club members might remember uh, Jean-Pierre Dick, who came to give a uh, presentation about the Vendée Globe a number of years ago. And, Jean-Pierre was the uh, skipper of that boat. Um, these boats were one design. I think the idea was to try to contain the costs uh, because the Orma 60s just got out of control, but um, didn't, quite, didn't quite work out that way. And then and now we're into the all teams, the 100 foot trimarans, either for solo or full crew. And there are uh, seven, eight, nine of these um, with uh, uh, the the, the Jules Verne trophy having come way down from the original 80 days uh, to uh, in the 50s, then the 40s, and now, now the low 40s. And uh, uh, both of those records from, there they are again, Francis Joyon, Francois Gabar, um, just incredible sailors. Anything else yeah. about that one? Well, you can see that uh, many, many brands are on the boat, massive is an insurance company, a big one. Sodebo is a sandwich company, a big one. And Sodebo is paying part of the Vendée Globe organization too. So you can have banks, you can have services, uh, companies, you can have food, goods, all kinds of companies are able to invest in, in those boats because uh, they earn a lot of money if they invest in these boats. Okay, and this is the latest one that was just launched uh, after being rebuilt um, from a capsize in that last route to Rome with Arma Le Cleache, uh, the skipper right there in front of the V. Uh, boat's 100 feet long, 75 feet of beam. And you can see his record. Uh, so he will be out there again. Uh, and the boat was launched 10 days ago. So she's, she's, she will sail in a few days, the first miles. We're gonna see, but I, I presume she was gonna be very fast. Very, very fast. Yes, of course, okay. she's sailing on hydrophones, of course. Yes. So then um, we're getting, getting to the close here. Um, you can talk a little bit about the training centers and um, when 
I arrived uh, with the boat for the first uh, Vendée Globe. We went to Port La Forêt, which is up in the northwest corner of France, and actually it was a race back from Brazil to to Port La Forêt was just a qualifier for me. Um, it's a tiny little town with a big marina, and off of those, off of Port La Forêt, was these rocky islands called Lake Lanon. And it turns out that they have a monstrous uh, training center there. Uh, 14,000 sailors a year are trained in Lake Lanon. Um, and it's with all volunteer instructors. So it's quite remarkable. But Denny, perhaps uh, that, that's just one of the a couple of the things that uh, really stunned me when I was looking at looking into it a little bit. Well, oh, this is part of the success of this type of sailing in France, because we have a lot of training center. I'm talking about professional training center. And the rule when you enter one of these centers is that you have to share your experience. That's rule number one. If you do not share, if you're not part of the community, you cannot stay. So that's why you can learn a lot. And I think that it is one of the key points of uh, the success of the selling industry in France. So we, of course, have Leglenon as a historical uh, school created by, by Michel Desjoyeux's father. Just after the, the war, the Second World War, we have Port La Forêt, you mentioned it, Rich. Lorient, half of the city is dedicated to this selling industry. La Rochelle has a training center, and then we have a lot of others. And just have a look on the, uh, the, the, the people uh, who register in the French Federation, 235,000 people registered. So we have a strong federation. And I was talking about General de Gaulle uh, at the beginning, and it is General de Gaulle who invited the way the sports is organized. And this federation belong to the French government. So there is a strong relationship between the state, the government and our federation. Also, just make a comment there. Um, that photograph of La Rochelle shows how many different ports uh, have simply been built out of building a couple of big breakwaters. And there are 4,500 boats, 4,500 slips in there. And so it makes it a lot easier to get to your boat. You don't have to necessarily be a member of some of a like we have here yacht clubs that have launch services to get to your your boats um, I, I live here in marblehead and that's the only way to get out to the boat so um the marinas uh, are probably uh, supportive of that and also the notion that some of the uh, brands um something like bank popular credit agricole those are big big banks uh, anyway but um Fleury michon was a pretty small uh, meat company as i recall and they became a big meat company by sponsoring Philippe Poupon through 12 different boats. And uh, you know, Bank Populaire is, is on with 11 and they may also sponsor boats. Uh, they, they may be sponsoring a Figaro boat, a class 40 and the old team. Uh, so it, it will go across multiple, uh, multiple uh, uh, sizes. And um, when Denny was talking about the common knowledge, I just have to, tell a story that some people may have heard. Um, you know, um, when I arrived in Port Lafrey that first time, uh, qualifying for the first one day club, I saw Michel Desjoyeaux, I had met him maybe once somewhere on a dock and I saw him on the dock there. And uh, I asked him in my best high school French if I could send him some questions about how to sail these boats. And he was very appreciative of the fact I was attempting to speak in French. And he said, yes, it would be OK to send some some questions and it's OK to send them in English, which I'm sure was because my French wasn't so good. But when I got back to the U.S., I, I, uh, I uh, wrote out 10 detailed technical paragraph long questions in my best high school French with a dictionary and sent them over because of my respect for Michelle and for the French and for this great race and so forth that 
it was only fitting to do that. And uh, within 24 hours, I got a response back from him in English, um, <laughs> answering all of my all of my detailed questions with details of his own. This generated, of course, questions back from me. I sent them those over in French again. 24 hours later, got answers back in English again. And it was really quite a remarkable exchange. I mean, it was 4,000 word email exchange on technical matters about how to, to, um, to sail a, 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 an open 60. And after the race that he won, um, I came in ninth um, out of that. Uh, we were at a book signing afterwards. And you can, I mean, I love that picture because it's, uh, it shows uh, there's just friendship. I mean, I'm obviously not a competitor of his, but I, 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 I'm hard pressed to imagine how uh, you're going to see in some of the professional sports a first place winner sitting there with you know, a big happy smile, having a chat with a ninth place winner or a ninth place finisher. And it's great. And then at the start of the second Vendée Globe, their picture and I, I saw him in the crowd and, uh, and, and uh, we just had a big hug and he, he just uh, said two words into my ear um, before the start. It was just come back. <laughs> and uh, That's about, that's, that's pretty good. That's, uh, that's what we want to hear. So um, that's, uh, that's our presentation. I just say, uh, merci Denis. Um, and I put uh, this last slide you've seen behind Denny, his, his uh, recently published book. It's in French for those who can speak French, uh, Mont Vendée Globe. And uh, um, then if somebody wants to hear a story in English, uh, mine's on the left. We went over a little bit there, but, uh, but uh, I, we still got almost everybody uh, hanging in there. So why don't we go back to, um, I'll stop screen sharing. And Dick, did you want to say something? I uh, just want to make a general announcement to the audience. Uh, uh, I hope this question and answer goes on forever because I'm fascinated. Uh, we, do, we do know that some of you do have dinner plans, but uh, I think uh, Rich and Denia are still game for talking more. I hope everybody stays on as long as they want. Uh, David and Rich Dillon will be uh, fielding some questions to them. Uh, if you've got to go, thank you for coming. But if you can stay on, please stay on. Thank you. Yeah, we still have uh, something over uh, 200 people on, judging by the number of devices, which had been uh, up to 180 or so, and now about 150. So cutting to the chase, Josh Reisberg says, does the US stand a chance? Um, what can we do differently to give American youth a chance to compete? Well, I, I mean, I, I would say I mean, it's a, obviously a bit of self promo here with the Collegiate Offshore Sailing Store, but we're trying to trying to make it easier for uh, young people to go offshore. With uh, um, we know that the racing part of it's uh, allure, so to have a one design fleet across colleges or community sailing centers uh, offers a chance to go and uh, race one design, and that's uh, that's just it takes you right away from all of the handicap uh, debates that you might have after the fact. Um, the boats are manageably sized, 33 feet. So even if you get into trouble, you're not gonna get into too much trouble. The boats are pretty bulletproof. I remember asking Michelle, Michelle had helped us uh, find a couple of the boats um, in France, um, actually bought a boat for us and turned around and resold it to us um, when the guy was gonna still charge us VAT. Um, and he knew that he didn't have to do that. and so. Um, he, he said, uh, you know, the boat's bulletproof. He said, yes. Uh, he said, I sailed, uh, I sailed my Figaro uh, upwind across the Bay of Biscay, 55 knots, true wind speed, no problem. <laughs> and my, when I tell that story, it's like, well, no problem for Michelle Desjoyeaux, oh, problem for the rest of us mortals. <laughs> Denis, a question that came in, are the sailing centers in France underwritten by, by the government, uh, the uh, federal government, or are they underwritten by the cities they're in? They are, uh, the first are uh, organized by the cities. And then as it work, the French Federation said, hey, hey, we're gonna do it together. So Port La Forêt, first of all, was organized by Michel Desjoyeaux, Jean Le Cam, Roland Jourdain, and some others. 
25 years ago. And it, it grew and grew and grew up. So the French Federation wanted to put the stamp on it. And now it belongs to the city and the Federation. And La Rochelle, for example, is the, in the same situation. And uh, La Grande Motte in the south of France too. So when a center works, the French Federation will help and will we'll give some technicians, some trainers, some means uh, to develop the, the, the activity. Great. Walter Kress asks, asks an interesting uh, question. And then, then Rich, why don't you go ahead and ask a couple of questions when this one is uh, done. And, and Walter says, how did the French um, and other shorthanded sailors surmount the circadian rhythm challenge so successfully? Catnaps have been discussed, uh, but there must be more to it than that. Uh, Denis or, or, or Rich Wilson, can you answer that question? Well, I could take a take a first stab at it. Um, yes, um, I had uh, studied with Claudio Stampi um, before I kind of got into all of this, and and uh, I know that in Paris that there's a uh, a sleep institution um, where they offer perhaps a ten day or two week kind of a program where they will you know rather than just going into a sleep lab and getting all the wires hooked up to your head and <laughs> trying to think that you're going to actually sleep through that, which you're not, of course. Um, uh, and they can teach you, uh, Claudio could teach uh, some techniques for trying to group some shorter naps together. Um, I think the, the French have obviously gotten this down to a better uh, uh, standard than I ever was able to do. Denny, you might be able to pick up on that from, from your well, knowledge. Well, many, many doctors are working on the subject, but what they say is that you can, uh, you can control your, uh, your rest better if you, if you uh, work on, on, on the subject. But anyway, you, it's gonna be, because you will sail and practice and practice and practice, that you will succeed in controlling uh, more and more what uh, the way you sleep and the way you rest. But right. but many many doctors are are working on the subject. Right. Uh, Rich know, Moulin, did you have a question to ask? Uh, David, can I just add yeah. one little to that? Well, I remember when we were preparing the boat for the first uh, race uh, in Port La Fere, um, and <clears throat> there were a bunch of the Figueroas were there as well. And you know, on a Friday afternoon, you'd see the Figaro sailor come down to his boat, and uh, with a with a, a cooler and a duffel bag of clothes, get on the boat, and he'd head out solo, and go training for two days, and come back Sunday night and go back to work Monday morning. And so they were really practicing; they were going out all the time. And uh, like Denny was saying, you that's how you're going to learn the rhythms that you need. Very interesting that uh, I'll just point out that uh, one of the clubs uh, hosting tonight, Large Mind Yacht Club, we do have uh, members who uh, who race a Mod 70 named Argo. That's Jason Carroll's boat with Chad Corning aboard. So there's uh, there are a few Mod 70s still alive and well, and one happens to be uh, uh, sailed out of Large Mind Yacht Club. Uh, the next, the Olympics in 2024 are in France. And there seems to be a lot of politicking going on with the International Olympic Committee. The hope that the World Sailing uh, you know, Organization has is that mixed double offshore sailing will be in the Olympics uh, in a boat like a Figaro, one male, one female on board in a two or three day race, which would be an around the clock event, which does not exist in the Olympics right now. Uh, Denis, do you have any idea whether this uh, with this new event in the Olympics is likely to actually happen? And can France, as the host of the 2024 Olympics, do anything to make it happen? Well, France has been proposing this uh, seven or eight years ago. So uh, interna uh, world, world selling was absolutely okay to have it in the 10 
series into in uh, and to have it into the the ten medals. Now the uh, uh, Olympic organization is refusing now so far to have this uh, new uh, competition organized in 2024. And the last news I talked with the president of the French Federation today so, uh, about something else. And he told me that he thinks that we gave all the reasons uh, to organize it and that the Olympics organization is still so far refusing to do yeah. it. So we think that we will not have such a new uh, middle uh, in 2024. Uh, that is too bad because it certainly excited a lot of people. Uh, between that and actually COVID, uh, there was a big surge of double-handed sailing in America last year. And we're hoping that momentum continues. Uh, how many foreigners uh, move to France or spend a lot of time in France to, to go through the training that the French are receiving? How many foreigners do you see there? Uh, or around 20. Okay. Uh, Denis, here's something that's come in. Somebody says, let's talk about money. When you say budget is controlled as you did uh, regarding one of the slides, what does that mean for the Vendee Globe, for example? What does that cost for an entrant? Well, budget are not, con <laughs> not control in the Vendée Globe. I was saying that we had some big boats with uh, uncontrolled budgets. And because of this, we created small series, smaller boats with control uh, budget for the 40 feet, for example, and for the, the tram around 50 feet. Uh, for the bond, for the Vendée Globe, it is not controlled. So let's talk about the Vendée Globe. Um, the highest budget for the Vendée Globe is around 25 million euros uh, on four years, and the smallest one is around 0.6 or 0.7 million euro during two or three years. So the, here you can have uh, the, the two, the, two uh, the, the highest and the smallest budget between 25 and 0.6. Uh, I think million. when, uh, when uh, Denny is using the word controlled, he's meaning uh, not necessarily it's a fixed kind of control budget, but um, just less um, than the top boats. And, and I would bring uh, that lower number just down a little bit when I was in the 2016 Vendée Globe, I was having a daily email exchange with Alan Rura, who was near me, the young Swiss skipper. And he said that his budget for the, for the whole event was 300,000 euros. Right, yeah. Guy DeBoer uh, wrote in and said, greetings from Key West. He says, I'm the US entrant in the upcoming 2022 Golden Globe race. Uh, and that says in the United States, what with uh, football, baseball, et cetera, we can't compete when it comes to the media. Any comments on that, Rich Wilson? You have a special perspective. <laughs> yes, well, it's, it's, it's not easy, but I think you still try to chip away at it, probably uh, get whatever coverage you can get. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps it's, uh, you know, we thought when we, certainly with the second one at Globe, when, uh, you know, I've got asthma, we tried the asthma companies, um, I was on Medicare for the second one day. Well, we, we tried the AARP. We, we had seven meetings with them and we didn't get anywhere for that. So it's pretty hard. But um, I think perhaps uh, Denny had said uh, when he was talking, when we were talking earlier about uh, sort of France being the size of Texas and so forth. Um, and I asked him, uh, you know, whether uh, in our earlier conversations, whether you know, if he has recommendations for us with cost on the figure of two, so that um, because of that smaller size, really try to keep things regional and focus on the regional and not, you know, don't try to be a national sports hero because it's not going to happen here. But um, perhaps, uh, you know, if there's some New England, uh, East Coast, Atlantic, uh, 
you know, that sort of region, you can, you might be able to focus on, on that and get some more press or just local press. Right. Rich DeMullen, a last question from you. And, and perhaps after that, a last word from Dick York before we close out. Uh, before I lose the microphone here, I have to congratulate uh, Denis and, and Rich. I think that dialogue they had was terrific. And it, it's wonderful that you shared it with us. Uh, the, co the course of the Figaro uh, is so impressive to me that it's raced in the English Channel, the Bay of Biscay, and the Irish Sea with some of the worst current, worst storms, worst traffic, uh, most challenging sailing area possibly in the world other than the Southern Ocean. And with all the Figaro's you've been involved with, Denis, have there been any serious casualties? We had, uh, we had one real accident. Uh, the accident occurred with one guy who had only one arm working. The other arm was not working. We could not say, I cannot say that it is because of the, the guy had a handicap, but the guy had a handicap and he sunk, he went on the rocks and he ended his trip swimming. So we've been looking for this guy during 12 hours. And this was absolutely terrific. At the end of the day, we could find the guy on the rock and the boat was destroyed on the rocks, but the, the guy was safe. This is one, uh, one uh, terrific accident. The other one I remember is Alain Gauthier uh, falling in, in the water uh, because he was trying to take some seagrass out of the propeller. So he was uh, overboard and he, he, he felt in the water. So the boat went sailing and Alain was swinging and he was rescued by another boat coming uh, after him and he was rescued. So it was all right. So these are the two real accident I remember about the Figaro. Okay. It's amazing because you've it's had so many safe. sailors and so many races and the toughest sailing. It just speaks to the level of preparation yeah. and skill of these people and you guys running it. And I'll hand that over now to Dick York. Gee, I can't thank uh, Denis and Rich enough. This was just spectacular. Uh, I've been also reading in addition to the Q and A, a number of the comments and everybody's loved your presentation. We thank you so much. I also want to thank David Tunick and Rich DeMullen for, uh, for running the Q and A. Uh, Angel Nesbitt's in the back room too, along with uh, our rock star for uh, technical stuff is Tim Hill from New York Yacht Club. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, and on that note, I guess uh, I hate to have this meeting go. Oh, by the way, this will this has been recorded, and it will be available at least on the New York Yacht Club site, and probably we'll get it up on others too. Rich Wilson, do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. I just like to to say it's been a, a real pleasure to put this together um, with uh, Denny and. Uh, I, you know, we're talking about the uh, the great popularity of these races in France and the family of the Vendée Globe and the family of this offshore sailing and so forth. And um, every time I pass through Paris now, it's been a while, of course, but, you know, Johnny and I will get together for lunch uh, with our contact at the at the American embassy there, uh, Fabienne. And um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I was, it really struck me how warmly uh, we were welcomed, we with our American team were welcomed by all of the French um, there. And uh, uh, it's just been a great pleasure. And the, the innovation to see like Yannick Festivan, who won this year's Vendée Globe, was the one who invented those hydro generators that everybody has now uh, uh, between sort of the 2008 race and the 2016 race. And uh, um, just a great guy. And you get to know all these guys. And it's just like, you know, it's they're they're, but it's like I, I often say. Well, uh, I live in Boston, so you know, I'm a New England Patriots fan. I can go down to Foxborough, and I can, I would never have been able to meet Tom Brady, 
but I can you can walk down the pontoon of the Vendée Globe and you can see Michelle that you can talk to Michelle Desjoyaux or Jean Lacombe and and uh, Denny was a great uh, a door opener for me, introducing me to people around. We got to be friends there early on. And he's gone on to producing renewable technology conferences now, just created that out of thin air. So uh, uh, it's, he's one of my great friends in France. And what a pleasure this has been, Denny. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you, Rich. Thank, thank you, Denny. Yeah. And yeah. especially, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denis, and especially thank you to Dick York for being in the driver's seat on this and for uh, organizing it. Uh, Dick, anything else? Otherwise, we'll uh, sign well, off. Tim, uh, we can, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut this off. Again, thank you very much uh, for all the attendees. Uh, and thank you for our all-star group here tonight. Great. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye. This is the New York Yacht Club. New York Yacht Club, CCA, Storm Tricycle Club, and Barchmont Yacht Club signing off. Good night.